So good morning, everyone. Um, in the next 35 minutes, I would like to shed some light on the research we have been doing uh, to actually prevent and detect malicious domain names on .eu. And I will also tell you a little bit more how we actually put this ID also into operation. But before I start, maybe a little bit about myself. I'm Levin de Smet. I'm a senior research manager at the University of Leuven, working in the research group Distiret. We're working on application security and DNS security, and also recently we have been building out a team on security analytics, which is actually focusing on this topic. Apart from my work at the university, I'm also supporting SecUpDev, which is actually yearly organizing security application development courses in Leuven. I'm supporting Integrity, which is a European bug bounty platform, and I'm also active in the local chapter. But more important, uh, for this work, we have been jointly working with Eurit, which is the registry which is responsible for running the .eu uh, TLD, so the domain name zone .eu. In the title, we're talking about malicious domain names, so it may be a little bit important to schedule the scope what we're talking about. So domain names are often being abused by cyber criminals. They, for instance, need domain names to send out spam, to send out phishing, to receive phishing answers, also to distribute malware, or to set up an infrastructure for command and control for their botnets. But as a security community, what do we do? We create blacklists. So the moment we see that certain domains are being abused by cyber criminals, we put them on blacklist, or servers are regularly fetching the information from blacklist, and in that way, once the service is being registered on a blacklist, it's actually making less effective for the cyber criminal. So what does a cyber criminal do in this position? Well, he actually uses a domain name, throws it away after being blacklisted, and going to the next domain name. So there's a fast flux, and you see a hit and run strategy in domain names. And a study of 2013 from uh, people that were looking especially to domains used for spamming already revealed that most of the domain names used for spamming are used less than one day, and then they're thrown away, not, not used anymore because they're being blacklisted. So there comes our research hypothesis. If the cyber criminals really, really only use a domain name for a very short amount of time, a very short period of time, like one day, and if they want to operate their operations continuously, they need a lot of domain names to use for that. So they actually need a lot of domain names to support their activities. And if they do so, probably they're registering continuously and probably in bulk if the volumes are high. And this is also the starting point of our research. If that is the case, maybe we can find ways where we can identify the registration behavior, where we can actually find the ways or the patterns the malicious actors are using to register such a bulk of domain names, such a volume of domain names. And if that is the case, we can try to understand how the ecosystems works to register malicious domain names. And secondly, we can go one step further, and we can try to prevent and detect malicious domain names. Detection means that we can already know that a certain domain name is being registered and can be used for malicious activity. Preventing is one step further. We can already make sure the moment we see a registration coming in, we just prevent that registration from being active actually being queryable in a DLT zone. And that would be actually the ultimate goal of this uh, research. So maybe an outline of the talk. I will actually split the talk up in three parts. The first part is actually a longitudinal analysis. We studied for 14 months of registration data on .eu, and I will give you a little bit more highlights about that 14 months of data, and also construct the idea of a campaign. So the clustering or the bulk volume of a malicious actor, we will define that in the campaign analysis. Based on those campaigns in the second part, I will give you some insights in what patterns we recognized in searching and uh, analyzing each of those campaigns individually and the overall data set of malicious activity. And the most important part is the conclusion towards the proactive defense. In the third part of the uh, uh, presentation, I will give you a little bit more insights in we, how we actually operationalize this in making a system that detects and prevents in .eu the detection of malicious domain names, how do we do that, what are the early results in the system. This is for the last part of the talk. So first, let's go to the longitudinal campaign analysis. Since you're sitting close to the stage, whenever you have a question, make sure to ask the question already up front, and we can even discuss during the talk, we don't have to wait till the end of the talk to discuss certain of the things. So the domain registrations in .eu, uh, .eu is the eighth largest country code TLD, so it's actually all the domain names within the European economic area. The zone file accounts for about 3.8 million domain names. And the data set we used in this research is a little bit older. We actually uh, have the registrations of April 2015 till May 2016 being analyzed. So 14 months of registration data, 
and this accounts for about 820,000 new domain names that never have been used before in .eu. For that data set, we found out with querying external blacklists that 2.5% of those domain names were actually being marked as malicious, about 20,000 domain names in our data set. What data did we use while analyzing? So we had the, the registration data available. So we have basic registration information, such as a domain name, the date of registration, the time of registration, via which registrar, and then mainly the contact information of the registrant. So which company, which language, the email address being used, phone, fax, as well as the postal address. And apart from that, we also have the operational details for the name service, so which name service are being operationalized for this particular domain name, and if present, also the blue records for this name service. So this is the main data coming from the registration. Blue records are if you're actually having domain name pointers in your own domain zone that you're registering, you need a bootstrap IP address to find them. And that's actually the glue record also delivered at registration time. So imagine that I have OWASP.eu, I registered the domain, but my name service of ns1.owas.eu, ns2.owas.eu, I can't find them going from top to down. So in that sense, you need to provide already an .eu. In order to find the name service, you have to go to those glue addresses. We had the data set, we enriched quite early in the registration process. First, we wanted to know whether those domain names were malicious. So we're querying different sources of blacklists. In our research, we're querying Spam House, the SIR multilist, and the Google Civ browsing list. Next to that, we also look up the geolocation of the name service to know where the name service are being deployed within uh, the world. So these are the basic elements of our data set. Whenever further we are talking about the data we export, this is the data we are talking about. And then we come to the campaign identification process. So we now have a bunch of registration data for 820,000 domain names. We see all the registration data. We see also whether they are malicious or not. How do we actually bootstrap this? In order to find out which domain names might actually become from the same actor, we first look at the malicious domain names because those are the ones that we're most interested in. Then we actually group the registration based on similarities between the registration details. And we have some heuristics to start from. For instance, peaks in registrations. If you have days where a lot of malicious registrations happen, that are the first days to zoom in a little bit deeper. If you see strong discrepancies between, malicious, between benign and malicious registrations, where only certain topics are being used in malicious, this is also a good way to start. But we have a whole methodology being uh, written down in the paper I refer to at the end. But starting from that, we actually identified campaigns in our data set, and I will give you two examples of campaigns to give the flavor what we are talking about. What are those similarities? What is that kind of bulk volume we're we talking about? So the first one is campaign C11. This is actually a very simple one. This is actually the normal campaign we see in our data set. This particular campaign has been running for eight months and uh, delivered 1,200 malicious registrations in our data set. This accounts for about half of the registrations that those registrations have been doing in .eu. How were they composed? Well, they were actually creating fake registrants and they were doing that by do using a combination of email accounts, phone numbers and street addresses. So they had actually two email addresses, three phone numbers and four streets and they were combining that in fake registrants and using them to register domain names. Of course, there are other patterns that are a little bit more subtle, but this is the main idea of how they were operating. And at the beginning, they were actually very uh, uh, curious about how they were combining those. So they were having email one, phone one, and register six. But at the end, they become sloppy, and you see they're actually mangling their different features together. And that's also the way where we easily could already see this is an interesting group to look into. And then we also found other patterns in the way they were registering the time of registration and so on. But this is one campaign we found in our data set, a quite simple one. We found also more advanced campaigns in our data set. And if you would give out the label or the award for the most uh, advanced campaign in our data set, we think C15 would be the one belonging to that. How did they operate? They did not have a few, several items to create the registration details. They actually started from 98 fake registrants. They didn't do it themselves. They were actually relying on a hacker tool, the Laravel faker tool, which was actually generating uh, fake registrant details within uh, the Dutch or within the Netherlands. Secondly, what did we explore within their 
domain names. All the domain names were actually consisting of several Dutch words concatenated to each other. Two or three Dutch words concatenated. And from time to time, they even have intermediate letters between the Dutch words. One thing that they did not do well was actually they were reusing the same Dutch words or the same collection of words across the 98 registrants. So as a way to identify that those registrants have been linked. And another interesting feature, they were always registering with the same, reg with one registrant, either eight, 16, 24, or 32 registrations. And then they stop, they go to the next one. So the hit and run strategy, but the hamster variation is as well. This campaign has been active for more than eight months as well, and it only had 500 blacklisted domains. And the reason for that is that only one out of four of them registrations were being blacklisted. So all cases that either the other ones haven't been used for malicious activity, or they haven't been picked up by blacklist yet. So this gives you another sample of what the campaign looks about. Uh, we now zoom a little bit out the full data set to see how the different campaigns were actually operated within the 14 months. So this is giving you an overview of the 14 months. On the x-axis, you see the timeline going from March 2015 to June 2016. And each line represents one particular campaign. Each dot represents that on that date, there were registrations made that were marked malicious by the blacklist. The larger the dot, the more registrations for that particular day. So you see that they have varying start dates and end dates, and they also have varying intensity of the registrations on the day by day. Yes. Can I ask a question? Uh, what is um, the purpose of hackers to buy, so to cheat the domain name of uh, three random words in Germany, for example? Uh, I don't see the point of that. But so the, the question is, what is the point of actually having uh, a bunch of domain names, like 32 domain names, all consisting of Dutch words being concatenated? Yeah, and uh, totally random, so. And totally random? Well, the, the, the words themselves might have a meaning in a certain context. They might be, for instance, used in a phishing context, but I want to certain combinations of words actually create a certain confidence with their uh, uh, victims. But we didn't analyze what was the particular use of those domain names. It might also be they just need domain names, and we see that a lot of the botnets are creating domain names on being very random strings, but the random strings are popping up quite easily with the security analysts. As a human, we can easily recognize that a certain string is random. Also, we can use analysis tools to see that a certain string is random. If you see valid words that are being concatenated, just because we see the domain name, as a security analyst, it's very hard to see that this particular domain name will serve malicious purposes. So this could be the strategy. It's only a hypothesis or a speculation, but this could also be just below the, because they want to stay below the radar. But we don't have evidence on that. Dirk? For illegal sites uh, registration, is, is there a threshold of just one name, for example, if it gets too popular? Uh, there are some more than 400 uh, registrations a day. I mean, is that obvious already, or is that, uh, that, that could be illegal, or is that? Uh, so the question is, um, from certain of the data points you see already here, isn't it obvious already that the registration will be malicious? I would say yes, it is. But the fact is that a lot of those registrations are actually being useful already for the, the criminals. So they might actually register 400, but by the time actually someone is looking into more deeply what the registrant is doing, they might already be beyond the threshold of one day. So in that sense, it's true, certain things already pop up, but we don't know for sure, because the fact that they are actually registering and cost them money, there must be a reason why they do it. There's no threshold. This is actually a service operated by the registrars that actually are, uh, are accepting the registration and then the registry accepting them in the zone file. Okay. Okay, so the question is can we actually do something with the registration that they've seen coming in like 400 at one day? I would like to postpone that question to the, fact, to the part where we go to the proactive defense and detection, because it's a good question, what can we do in the .eu zone? Yeah, because what is at the moment the reason why they would make multiple permutations for address and telephone number at this moment, because they are not prevented right now. Well, they're not prevented in the registration, but of course the blacklist themselves are applying some kind of techniques as well. Okay, so, so if they're seeing certain things popping up or being scattered in the WHOIS, they might actually say, 
we actually, if we see a lot of people, uh, uh, domain names across different zone files from the same registrant, we will actually block them. This could be a reason why they have permutations. So it's not the EU uh, organization that is preventing, but the... At this moment, there are other organizations preventing. Yeah. This is also shedding the light on how the blacklists are looking to the zone file, not the way we are looking at the zone file at this moment. So I might not have the time in this presentation to discuss. I have a few slides at the end. The question is, did we do this analysis of the campaigns manually? Can this be automated through machine learning? Or what, what was the interplay? Well, we started manually. And we started manually lo looking in peaks into the, the different graphs that we draw, correlations between features. And we, this is the end result of the manual campaign analysis. We did do the same actually using machine learning. And there we saw we don't come to 20 clusters, but we come to much more smaller clusters really having the same specific key features. But those help to validate the, this manual analysis. And it's all written down in the paper we refer to at the end. You can talk to me afterwards to discuss the, the interplay between manual and automated. But we see it in our analysis that we need actually the combination. We need the manual and we need automation because they only can do fractions. For instance, to give you a detail, C11 is easy to be done automatically with machine learning. The C15, the Dutch patterns, actually we have to be honest because we were native speakers in Dutch, we were very easy to recognize those patterns within the domain names. A machine learning algorithm would have actually a hard time already to see similar patterns in there. Okay, with this I would try to continue, but be, f be free to, to ask a few questions more within the talk. So the campaign criteria, I will only shed a light very quickly. Uh, Within the campaigns, so we saw that mainly the registrant details were being used to clutter together um, the, the different malicious registrations, but also so some of them were using domain name uh, patterns, the registrar or the name service. I can't go in more detail here. Yes. So the question here is, um, this sounds very much like fraud with credit cards. Why don't you use the information they're using already there, like an IP address, location, uh, the time of the day? Um, we don't see particular details from registrations because the ecosystem of domain registrations is we have the registry, which is actually operating the zone file. We have the registrars appointed by ICANN, which are actually allowed to accept registration and then feed that in into the registry domain zone. And then you have also resellers that actually work on behalf or actually are reselling the registration service from the registrars. And the fact that an, an end client is uh, registering a domain name, the IP address, the location, is something that the reseller or the registrar may, may see, but the registry we don't see, we only communicate to registrars. So in that sense, if you would unfold the whole ecosystem, you could actually at different stages already gain more information, but that information does not get into the data set we got. Okay, I think with this we already shed the light on what is the data set, what are the campaigns. Maybe now it's time to go a little bit more detail what were some of the insights that we actually found while analyzing either individual campaigns or the overall data set. So the first one is a reconfirmation of the study that I already pointed out before. What is the window of opportunity for a hacker? And also in our data set we found that after a few days, the majority of domain names that get blacklisted already blacklisted. So after five days, three out of four domains that will be blacklisted are already blacklisted at that moment. Take into account that at the time that we were doing the study, we had like one day of delay before the information was uh, propagated to us. So this might actually be already that this one is actually a little bit higher on the first day already. But this means that there's only a short window of opportunity before they get into blacklists. And then the question pops up, what is the reason why they pop up on blacklists? So we also did a more fine grade analysis for each of the campaigns to see what blacklist was actually uh, pointing that one out and what was the reason. We don't go over the full table. I will only highlight a few of the details here. So the first type is what abuse type was the reason why being blacklisted. And you will see it downstairs uh, at the down of the slide that for all the malicious uh, activity within our data set, 
94% of them were actually being labeled because of spam. And then, of course, an obvious question is, is spam the most prevalent thing where they're using malicious domain names? I would be a little bit more careful. I would state that spam is probably the most prevalent in being reported to blacklist. So end users quite often see that they're being spammed, also intermediate mail servers, they get reported, they get blacklisted. With, with, with phishing mails or even for spear phishing, those domain names might also be used, but might not be easily uh, reported to blacklist. So I would be a little bit be, be careful with interpretation here, but of course it has an impact or a bias on our study. So we say we can already predict or prevent malicious registrations. If you learn from spam domains, probably we're also preventing spam domains. The second thing in the table I want to highlight is which source did we use of the blacklist for each of the campaigns. One thing that's already popping up, none of the campaigns that we identified had actually their domain name being registered in the Google Safe Browsing List. So only 2% of all the malicious domain names in our data set were being flagged by uh, the Google Safe Browsing List, but none of the campaigns actually were on that list. And for the rest, act we actually need a combination of both Spam House and Sir because we see certain campaigns were only blacklisted by SIR, others were only blacklisted by Spam House. So optimally, we have multiple blacklists being combined into one oracle of being malicious, yes or no. So this is the data I want to describe here. Then I want to take one step back again and look into the overall data set of 40 months. We already saw a few variations in here. Already mentioned out certain of the campaigns are quite intensive. And it's indeed, we see a lot of variation between the intensity and the duration of campaigns. For instance, campaign C13 only had 154 registrations, but it has been active for over 300 days. So it's actually quite long that they were using the same details to register domain names, but doing it at a very low rate. In contrast, C20 was only active for less than 40 days, but actually had about 2,000 registrations in that time window. So you see, not all actors are actually operating in the same way. One other thing that was being popped up while we were doing the machine learning to validate the campaign analysis, what we already referred to, was the fact that we say there are 20 different campaigns or 20 different actors in the ecosystem. Well, it turned out that maybe 20 was an overstatement. We saw that certain campaigns actually had links together, so two and three are most probably from the same actor, eight and 12 are from the same actor, 16 and 19, uh, 18 are from the same actor. So I would like to refine and say, well, probably in the 80% of the domain names that popped up in campaigns, there are up to 20 different actors active in display. Was that a question? No, so it, one of the things is are the relations between different campaigns because they were high intense, they were being caught and they were refining. They were five different so we didn't see such a pattern. So we see that certain of the campaigns might in time actually come off each other. For instance, also you see here C9 is stopping here and actually starting here with the campaign. So there might be some temporal analysis that refines that certain campaigns might be linked. But we didn't find evidence that it's really the same actor because we don't know where they're coming from or we don't know the individuals behind the campaigns. So that might be that the 20 actors is really an overstatement, but only three people are responsible for the majority of the domain names. That could very well be. And we see also that there are patterns certain are really using the, the low hanging fruit like C11. C15 is much more advanced. And even if it has a high intensity because it's so advanced, it actually might run for a longer time before they actually have to change their strategy. Because they from time to time were actually using the same email address that we, as an oversight we didn't see in our manual analysis. So because the machine learning is really processing uh, a clustering algorithm that tr tries to actually merge two clusters together, the moment we actually see that one of our campaigns was actually, uh, that two of our campaigns were in the same cluster, we tried to identify what was the reason that those got actually clustered together. And then we really could verify that we had some oversights in the way we're doing 
Or for instance, we're saying, well, this campaign is using 10 private email servers to, uh, to uh, register new domain names. And then we see that another campaign is actually doing the same on an 11th one, and we didn't see that one. But we see the same patterns, we see the same timing, so we actually have a, a strong uh, feeling that those campaigns are really linked together. And those things were felt by the automatic machine learning. So another thing, uh, we are in a DevOps track here, uh, apparently, so we think that all things are automated. Well, this is the case. Certain of the campaigns, we see really automation popping in. For instance, here, campaign C19, apart from some manuals, we see that it's always on the same time done by a cron tab. We see at a certain moment they're actually shifting to two times a day. And the only anomaly in our, in our graph is the, the moment we actually, on our side, are changing to summertime. The question, of course, is, is this the case for all domains? Well, it is not. So let's look to this graph. This graph is actually representing registrations for one month of time. And each point on the lines is actually the share of registrations on that day in our total data set. So we're actually trying to see relatively how many registrations did we have on that day. If you're looking to the bluish line, it's representing all the domain names benign and malicious. And we see that we have a, 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 a recurring pattern of weekdays and weekends. During the weekends, it's a bit lower. During the weekdays, we have more registrations. If you're looking to the red line, it's only the malicious ones. We see the same pattern, but it's much more extreme. So we have little to no registrations at all during the weekends, but we have a lot of registrations during the weekdays. And there might be several hypotheses here. Either they're trying to mimic the business behavior and they're overdoing it, but it could also be that they're just humans and are taking off during the weekends. We don't know. So we're going a little bit deeper in our analysis. Now we're actually looking into the overall data set. These are all the malicious registrations, and again, a percentage per, uh, per week of how many domain names were registered during that week. And here again, we see three points that have low registrations that might be interesting. We see the summer break in July, the Christmas break in December, and we see the spring break during uh, February, March. So in that sense, it might be that they are not only taking off the weekends, that might be also taking holidays during those periods. Or they're trying to mimic business behavior and they're overdoing it. Or third, it actually might be a demand and offer question. It might be that during the periods of summertime or Christmas break, their victims are also not at home or not actually checking their email, and maybe they're using less spam mail addresses as well. We can't be for sure, we just can speculate about different options. So that's the reason why we even go one step further and looking into individual campaigns. And those are two interesting campaigns, C11 and C18. So first, let's look to C18. Here, what we want to draw is what hour of the day were registrations being made by that campaign? And we see that the majority of registrations of C18 were all in the fixed block of 10 hours during the day. It seems to be shifted in a time zone more to the, to the west, but at least it seems that they might actually have some kind of a feeling of a day, day pattern. But more interesting, if we look to C11, we see the same pattern occurring again, but it seems that I like working in the morning, taking a lunch break, and starting again. So again, each of the different individual graphs is not conclusive, but combining all the graphs together might have again that at least some of the campaigns are being less automated, being more correlated to humans, actually taking weekends, holidays, and also working, working hours nine to five. Another insight, what are the facilitators? We, who is actually helping the malicious actors to register their domain names? And we're looking to registrars and email providers. For the registrar, we see that almost 50% of all the malicious domain names are coming via one registrar. If you're looking to the toxicity, toxicity means if you have 100 domains of that particular registrar, how many of them are being malicious? We see that it's 36%. This one is actually large above the 2.5 average that we have. So we see that register five attracts a lot of cyber criminals to register their domain names. Is register five really malicious? I wouldn't dare to, what? They have a good API is a good answer there. <laughs> they might be cheaper. Or they have resellers that are doing the, the bad stuff for them. And the register themselves might say, we don't know about it. So it's not so easy that we can say in the ecosystem of DNS, we just scratch out register five and all the problems will be gone. 
We even see the case where we're actually talking to registrars and saying that they have a lot of malicious activity, that the problems are shifting to other registrars by doing, because they are doing additional verification on their endpoints. With the email provider, it's a little bit different. We see for Gmail has about 20%, but a toxicity of 2%, which is below the average. So a lot of domain names are using a Gmail address, but it's not necessarily that they are actually having more malicious than the others. For AOL.com, it's a little bit different. There we see 10% malicious, but a toxicity of about uh, 50%, which means that if you're using an AOL address as an attacker, well, one out of two of your domain names are probably malicious. Reason here again might be API-like things. It might be that other email, public email providers having better uh, defenses in place for automated creation of new accounts, and AOL might be lacking a little bit behind in that same. It's not necessarily that AOL is really helping the cyber criminal by saying he had a lot of email addresses, but it is a fact that we see that correlation in our data set. What else do we see within our data? Well, the, the, uh, the attackers are clever as well. They're, for instance, adaptive in their strategy of choosing a registrar. They're swapping to different registrars sequentially over time. It might be because they're being caught. It might also be because another registrar is just cheaper or they're following their reseller. And the last thing I want to give as an insight is the campaigns versus blacklists. We are talking in this presentation mainly about campaigns. Campaigns are 80% of them all being blacklisted. But we see at both sides that there are domains that are blacklisted but not in our campaigns, and campaigns that are, uh, domains that are in campaigns but not being picked up by blacklists. And that's actually the interesting part of the data. So we did additional analysis. When we did an additional analysis of those 4,000 domains, we found that most of them were actually really tied to uh, domains that were being marked malicious. They had the same registration details. They're really coming from the same registrant. And we only found less than 1% of false positives in our analysis. So this is an interesting next step because this means that our existing blacklisted can be easily topped up by 20% of doing just such a campaign analysis on TLDs. And with it, I would like to close the inside part and go to the prevention and detection unless there are certain urgent questions within the audience. Um, did you also, uh, next to the information from the registration, um, for instance, uh, validate how fast the main, the main nature record was uh, yes. registered? So we have a second line of research actually focusing more on the query logs and also the information that is being supplied within the DNS zone. We see similar correlations coming as the ones here, reconfirming some of the campaigns, but we didn't include it in the same data set. So these are the first two different lines of work because while seeing well an MX record is being populated after registration does not help us at the moment of registration. That's the reason why we actually split up into two different lines. We have been talking to, for instance, Spam House about this, but this is not in place yet. This is something that can happen. So it's not already feeding the blacklist at this moment because they typically need some verification steps before they're actually entering domain names into their blacklists. So the prevention and detection. So if you already know how the malicious actors are doing, can we actually use these details already to prevent and detect? And there the machine learning kicks in again. What do we do? Based on all the previous domain registrations, we're actually training prediction models based on their data. So we actually have all the benign and all the malicious data. We're feeding them again into different classifiers and prediction models. And we're using that prediction model for each new registration coming in to predict whether it will be benign or potentially malicious. And then we come to the question, what do we do with the malicious? If the domains with malicious intent are being predicted, what can we do? We can inform, for instance, the blacklist. But at this moment, we choose actually to prevent them. So actually what we're trying to do at this moment is the moment such a domain name comes in, we're trying to delay the fact that they are being open in the DNS zone, and we do, for instance, manual verification steps or additional automated verification steps before we actually accept that registration from happening. That's what we're doing at this side. What are the underlying assumptions in our most uh, used uh, prediction models? We have one based on similarity. So we're clustering very similar to how we do the campaign analysis within our manual analysis that I discussed before. We have a seven, second predictor reputation based and there we're taking into the, uh, the reputation of the name server, of the registrar, 
of the email provider while actually classifying or uh, learning our classifier for our full data set. So these are the two strategies that are most successful in our operations. At this moment, this system is in operation at URIT. So this is part of URIT Security and Trust Program. And we actually have already running this since early 2018. And our preliminary results of the first 110 days in production, our best predictors actually come to results in the line of 80% of the domains can be predicted at registration time already. And they have a very high precision around one, two, and sometimes five false positives a day. This is actually the current operation within uh, URIT for actually using this technology. This also led that several domains have been seized over the past few months within URIT. So within the .eu TLD, we actually have been seizing a lot of domain names that were during our analysis and afterwards being identified as being malicious domain names. And these predictive algorithms are now actually running 24 seven in operations in the registration zones for .eu. Does that now mean that blacklist like kind of input to, for Eurit to uh, allow a domain or not? Is that, is that something that you would desire? So the blacklists are uh, indeed input for our classification. Uh, I would say it's a kind of uh, a starting point. We need to know which ones are malicious to actually learn from that actually to work. We see that there might be a problem in the near future if you are preventing all of the malicious domain names, none of them might end up on a blacklist. So we will not only use the blacklist, but probably also the prediction results themselves as well to refeed our training models. So what are the key takeaways for today? I would say rather a small number of actors are responsible for actually doing much, well, most of the harm in .eu for creating malicious domain names. We have facilitators, only a few facilitators already or helping the cyber criminals quite a lot. One registrar is a responsible for about half the registrations being fed in into the zone file. And also one public email provider has a very high toxicity. A second takeaway, this is more like a hypothesis that we try to confirm with certain of the research artifacts that we had. Cyber criminals are human. So we think they are lazy because they're actually using uh, fake registrants and they're reusing them over and over until they're actually being exposed. And secondly, the, if that is not the case, they're relying on automatic tools to actually do that for them as well. They work a little bit like a workforce, nine to five, or some of them working nine, 10 hours a day. Um, they're actually taking weekends and holidays and they're also making mistakes. So we also see that some of the registrations given in, they actually have registration details that have typos in that. Also reconfirming that probably a human is behind the scene. And third, they adapt over time like any individual will do, probably because of economical reasons. And the last bit, so we actually went to productive detection and prevention. The early results are actually looking very promising. We can capture a large majority of the malicious domain names and operating at a low false positive rate. But it will be very interesting to see how the ecosystem will evolve. So the moment we're actually preventing a lot of malicious domain names, Will they become more clever? Will they go to other TLDs? What if other TLDs are actually approaching the problem with the same systematic approach? How will the cat and mouse game go in the next few months, years, decade? And with that, I would like to refer to our paper that we have written about the manual campaign analysis for more details. And with that, I hope we did our work on actually trying to secure the .eu TLD zone it might inspire you to do your work as well in securing the ecosystem on the internet. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes for more questions, if you have some. Um, so it's a side question, but I don't know if the, I mean, the registrar, or is there any initiative to, to put the compliance in place, as we do with the authority, certification authority for SSL? Uh, to ensure that all the partners or our resellers are ensuring that they have fraud and bot detection in place, instead of having to each time clean yeah. clean the, uh, the the zones afterwards. Right. So I would say it's a little bit more complex than we would look at at this stage. Yeah. Um, I, I would say yes, there are continuous interaction between registrars and, for instance, Eurit in discussing also malicious activity, but other things as well. 
um, but the registers themselves are being appointed by ICANN. So you can't do it on yourself as being a TLD zone because there's an economical system as well with having different zone files. So even if you would ban a certain registrar of actually using .eu, they might actually promote another TLD zone. So in that sense, it's an ecosystem where uh, benefits in one zone, you actually need to tackle this more on a global scale. Yeah, yeah that's why I was talking about mainly about a global initiative. Yeah, on but then I think yeah. initiatives will probably have to come from ICANN or yeah. others. That's true. Okay. Thanks a lot. Dirk? One thing you ex explicitly didn't mention, but uh, it, it seems that uh, the uh, malicious activity took place also in Europe. The, the people said in Europe probably to uh, to register uh, those domains and not in China or in well, in America. Well, giving the time zones, I would say it's not purely Europe. So we see activity in the US and in other countries as well. Okay. Um, I would say the majority of registration details are from within the EU. Of course, they mostly fake with uh, the malicious registrants, but there's also a policy choice because within .eu, you can only have a domain if you're actually a citizen or a company within .eu, so they're just oh. probably faking that information as well. Okay, thank you. Yes. I will not make any public statement about that, but we did some analysis on the spring break and we can discuss it offline. <laughs> Okay, if they uh, fake the uh, <coughs> resistance information, uh, can't we uh, perform a filter on that, say a, a phone book uh, to see if a physical address message matches with a phone number? Yes, but I can look up any physical address just in the phone book as well. Company records are open, so if I want to in impersonate Facebook or whoever, I just have to look up the, the, the phone address. So that's one way where we see some of the more clever attacks are actually uh, using existing uh, addresses. So, for instance, we're now in the the soccer tournament, we saw, for instance, one of the campaigns were from time to time using uh, the stadia of soccer teams to actually use them as uh, their registration addresses. So they're all kind of creative in the way that they're finding fake addresses or they're actually impersonating addresses. But it doesn't help you because you can do a check and they're all being done checks all over the place to see how valid certain addresses are, are, are in the data set. But it doesn't help you because you can just take over another valid address quite easily. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you for the great talk, Levin. Yep. Uh, I want to remind you to... <laughs> I would like to remind you to vote on your way out and also visit uh, skate.org. <laughs>